Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Friday, the 16th day of September, year of our Lord, 2022. I do pray this finds you well on this very pleasant, very late summer day. Less than a week left in summer and fall will be here, at least on the calendar. I think most people think fall begins with Labor Day, but it technically doesn't. Technically does not begin until the equinox next week. Hopefully you'll get out and enjoy it. Looks like it's supposed to be a very pleasant week. We'll see if this candle stays lit here. It's, uh, I don't know why they get fussy like that when they're new. The don't know. Anyway, up there it goes. Okay. So I was out working in the yard later today and saw something I have never seen before. It was a brown snake. Usually I run into my work in the yard. I run into a garter. Uh, they like to send themselves on the mulch, the black mulch, and. Uh, um, they'll see them racing through the grass, and they're always kind of amazing because your eye focuses on the yellow stripe, and then they're gone because your eye can't follow that. It's very, you know, very cool the way they came by. It was a little brown snake, and it was, uh, they don't get very big. This one was about this big, maybe six inches, and that's about as big as they get, maybe a little bit bigger. And they're a beneficial predator. They eat slugs and other pests, and so uh, uh, and, and at this time of year, you probably think I'm, I'm nuts out there mowing the lawn. I am constantly stopping a lawnmower and relocating toads and stuff like that. I don't want to run over the toads. They're also beneficial. You know, I just don't want to, you know, run over it. Frogs get out of the way. There's a lot of frogs. We, uh, you know, frogs in the grass. Yes, quite a few. And they get big this kind of year. They're, they're leopard frogs, and we have tree frogs. I don't usually see them in the grass. They're everywhere else. And I don't hear too many out there now, but I'll hear them a little early today. I heard a, a tree frog. I mean, I know one's living up on my deck. But anyway, the snake. I wanted to get out of the path of where I needed to mow. Oh, there was a toad there too, and that was easy. You know, you just pick up the toad and um, maybe have to wash your hands afterwards because you know what toads do. Uh, it's okay; it's all harmless. But that snake was an army little thing. It, it you know, it it, uh, it coiled up, uh, you know, it, uh, um, and struck out at me a couple, three times. You know, uh, and a non-poisonous, uh, non-venomous is the correct term. Uh, uh, poison is something that we ingest. Uh, you know, but the snake is venomous. So a non-venomous snake I run into in my life in Illinois. I run into a timber, a timber rattle or two. And this is their area, the Mississippi River Valley, all up and down the state. And of course, they're going to get more common as you get further south. Uh, I've only run it. Co co copperheads, I've seen a number of those. Around, but it would be very rare to see one in my yard, nowhere near water. I would be very surprised to run into a timber rattle. I don't think there's enough food of that. Plus, we have other competition for food. Red foxes, you might hear them bark. They, they bark uh, this time. They're loud when they bark, but I'll, I'll see it out just right outside. This is a, uh, I'm in my basement, but there's a walkout, and I'll see it right outside the window. Um, so will my dog and, and bark uh, just right over there. Anyway, uh, that's a glimpse into my day. So it was a pleasant day. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. And we are going to turn to the daily lectionary, and the daily lectionary continues to bring us through St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. And tonight we're going to read the balance of chapter 2, starting at verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and all authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon Sabbath. 
These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on ascetism and worship of angels, going in detail about visions puffed up, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and ascetism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And that is the word of the Lord. Uh, that's a fascinating section of this short letter that Paul writes to the Church of Colossae. And he begins this section by saying, you know, don't let anybody take you captive by an empty philosophy, empty deceit, by wisdom that isn't wisdom, that just appears to be wisdom, by human traditions. Now, we have, and he's going to come back to that at the end of that, we have all kinds of traditions in the church that we aren't quick to get rid of. Um, we are a very traditional church, and tradition is a good thing. Tradition is the voice of those who have come before us uh, that can't, they don't have a voice among us physically, but their voice is the tradition that they pass down to us. And so we don't change those things lightly. However, having said that, we don't make them more of what they are. Traditions are good, right, and salutary. And we have to be careful about how we use that, too, because most of the things like we do in the liturgy, this is what people often go to in this, and, and uh, perhaps they're not wrong, but a lot of the things we do in the liturgy are, are not traditional from the standpoint of, you know, there's something we've done in this region for quite a while. There's things that have been handed down really since the beginning, and they are the Word of God, and they focus us, as Paul reminds us here, on the head of Christ. Now, it would be wrong for me to come in and say, I don't know, you know, um, that uh, we have a joke amongst pastors, and let me, let me say it like this, that you can say what you want and no one really cares. Now, that's, of course, hyperbole, uh, but uh, don't move the candle. And, and there's, there's, there's just enough truth to that to, to uh, make us a little uncomfortable, uh, that, you know, that people aren't so concerned about what, they, what I say, which is really what they should be doing, then than where the candle is placed. And that's maybe what we're talking about, or Paul is talking about here. If I, if I attach some meaning that Scripture doesn't to a piece of furniture or a posture that I assume and demand that you have to have that posture too in order to prove how religious you are and how holy you are, then I've missed the point. that the, the, the motions that we make in church you know, flow from Christ and, and the fact that we're in the presence of Christ. And I don't keep score of who makes the sign of the cross and who bows at certain times, you'll see me do it, one, because I'm there to teach, and two, to set, you know, well, set the example, that's really the same thing in this regard, but also to, you know, I do it out of love for Christ in my heart, Now, this doesn't mean people who don't do it have, don't have that love for Christ in their heart, but you see what the problem is, you know, if I start saying, well, you know, I love God more than you because I'm doing these things, there's the problem, there's the problem, um, you know, but again, we need to be careful with this because people will often use a text like this to say, I can do whatever I want, you know, no. Because remember, Paul also says, and he doesn't say it right here, we can go to things like 1 Corinthians, we can go to, we can go to the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is where we should start all these things. Uh, you know, his prayer is that we would be one, all right, and as is Paul's, that we wouldn't, there wouldn't be divisions among us, and that what we do builds up the body of Christ. So if we're just changing things willy-nilly because things are kind of cool to me or they mean something to me, and I hear that kind of stuff a lot. I don't hear it so much at the church end, but I've heard it, you know, in the community around me. Oh, this, you know, we got to do things this way because it means so much to me. Well, it isn't about you, pal. It's about us coming together and receiving Christ. Now, that's really where Paul is going. You know, keep your eye, keep your thoughts, you know, your heart, you know, keep yourself focused in Christ. You know, so he goes on to say, after he says, don't let anybody take you captive. So he says, okay, you know, Focus on the Christ. It has to be according to Christ. And why? Because in him the fullness of the deity dwells body. He is the Son of God. He is God. He is fully God and fully man. There we see it. And you, it's you, me, 
have been filled in him, you know, who is the head and rule of all authority. He is now our, you know, he is the one that all authority has been given to. In him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. In case we're not clear what Paul's talking about there, he makes it very clear. This is our baptism. It's a circumcision made without hands. And what did circumcision do? You're eight days old. The male was eight days old. He was circumcised and then put God's people into the covenant at eight days old. God says, this is how you, you belong to covenant. Same thing with baptism. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. How? You know, not circumcision, baptism. It's a circumcision made without hands. This is why we talk about it so much. It joins you to the death and resurrection of Christ. You're buried with him. And Paul's going to get very beautifully, beautifully specific about what that means in just a moment here. So, um, all this, you know, he's raised. You are raised with him through faith and the powerful working God. All this is the work of God in Christ, you know, who raised Jesus from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses, we are dead. We're born dead. We're born under the curse. We have a few years of breath, 70, maybe 80, you know, maybe a little bit longer. But death is always looming. We are born dead. Right? You who were dead in your trespasses, the wage of sin is death. We're born under the curse. When you eat from it, you will surely die. Here we are. You who are dead in your trespasses and in the circum uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. So all our sins, our trespasses, that's that cool word, Means you're going beyond the boundary God has set. And those boundaries, commandments, that God sets keep us safe. Keep our lives filled with joy. They're like a beautiful, um, people think they're like, oh, all the fun stuff's on the outside. No, that's what death is. I mean, just think about it. We start pulling down that beautiful um, guardian, you know, that God erects in his Ten Commandments that he hems us in with to protect us and to flourish. And there's nothing but death. Uh, think of the sexual revolution that began in the 60s and now has been going, what, for uh, over half a century. And look at what it's done to our community. People mock it all the time, uh, the commandments, but they, they can't open their eyes to see what the moving of those boundaries has done. Now we're celebrating the mutilating of human bodies uh, because you get to do whatever you want instead of rejoicing in just what you are and how God made you and finding you know what he would have you do, great or small, and rejoicing in that. And being filled with joy because of you know your station in life, whatever it appears to be to those around us, might be a great station in life. You might do great and noble things in a public view, but you might somebody who just lives your life in, quietly in a little corner of the world, filled with joy, and yet God is doing you know the same important work as He is doing with the the the, the great and the mighty from our point of view. So you know that God hems us in with his commandments, to keep us safe. You know, and we trespass that. We pull down those barriers and want to climb out to where death is, the cliff is. We fall off. And um, that beautiful language, our trespasses, which come with the death, are canceled. Right? The canceled, the record of all the times we have climbed outside that fence and embraced the culture of death, death, you know, um, whether we're tempted whether it's the sin within us, um, that debt, that record is canceled. How? Um, he set it aside, nailing it to the cross. Christ our Lord in his death, his passion. And he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by tri triumphing over them in him, in Christ. So Satan has no more authority over you to mock you, to, you know, he's, he's been put to shame in Christ. He's been destroyed in Christ. I, I just think, there's that wonderful hymn, and I'm singing it tonight, but uh, it's by C.F.W. Walther. Uh, he's risen, he's risen. And Satan's domain did the hosts shout and jeer, for Jesus was slain, the one the evil ones fear. And then he goes on to write, C.F.W. Walther, but short was their triumph, the Savior arose. And, and he, you know, death, hell, he vanquishes his foes. Now, this, this is the beauty of, by the way, of our hymnody. Um, I had a conversation, kind of an unusual conversation with somebody, in the last couple of weeks, it was a public thing, you know, that they were just not, you know, didn't like the hymns that we sing, you know, they're, they're too hard, they're, 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 you know, they want them simpler, it's like, yeah, but, you know, when you sit down and think of those words, 
And one, they're very clear for the most part. We have easier hymns, harder hymns, but I think of that beautiful words. In Satan's domain to the host shall endure, and it's part of me. You know, in Satan's domain to the host shout and, uh, shout and jeer. For Jesus was slain, the one they feared. So they thought it was, it was a victory. And then, but short was their triumph. You know, the third day he arose and he vanquished them. They were destroyed. Their power over you was destroyed. You know, what beautiful words. What beautiful. And the one I'll sing tonight is written by Thomas Akempis. You know, and just as I sing it, think of those words. So, yes, um, you know, we, we talk about these deep things that are sin was nailed to the cross and canceled in him. So then he goes on to say, Paul, in finishing here, goes on to say, don't, don't let anybody pass judgment on you on whether you're, you know, you're, you're, you're I'm not going to stand up there and pass judgment on you whether you bow at the right time, you know, that are, are serves in the case. Now, those are good and salutary things. I'm not saying don't do them. I'm just saying I can't pass judgment on you. Um, you know, that, uh, and, you know, like we have to observe church on this particular day. We can do it in many days. We should, we have to do it, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, like am I, I'm calling you to, to have a special feast on a new moon or a Sabbath. The things that he, that he says here, they might be good things, but they're a shadow. The content has to be Christ. And I have to be pointing you to Christ and him crucified. That's my job. And, and that's what prepares you to take your last breath. You don't have to be afraid as you face death. You know, why? Because Satan and death are destroyed in Christ. Your sin was destroyed. So you're going to be lying there in a hospital bed thinking about all the things you did wrong throughout your life. And Satan will be reminding you. And you just run to Christ. And you just remember in your baptism, your sin was all canceled. You're joined to his death where your sin was put to death, and you're joined to his resurrection. So, um, wonderful, absolutely wonderful reading here in Colossians. It gives us a glimpse of what they were dealing with, and we still deal with today, you know, that balance between what's good and salutary. And I'm a very traditional person. And then where we say, no, you know, we can't make a law where there is no law, and Jesus has to be at the center. And the traditions that we have have to point us to Jesus. Okay, that's a nice summary. All right. I could talk a lot about that, but this, you know, try to memorize this chapter. You were dead in your trespasses and, you know, but made alive. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. Okay. Let's confess our faith now using the word of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace, your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people. A light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, ever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, bless my, me and uh, pastor and my brothers in office as we prepare to proclaim your holy word this coming weekend, that we may preach the holy cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we resolve to know nothing amongst us but Christ and him crucified, and that as we proclaim this word, that the spread of the knowledge of Christ and his saving work on that cross would be spread to our communities, our people, their families, and indeed the whole world. Be with those who are persecuted and oppressed for your name's sake. Strengthen them that they may stand firm. And turn the hearts of the persecutors and oppressors that they may stand alongside us, confessing your holy name. As always, we pray for the sick and the dying. We ask you to be with Dennis, Dave, Sandy, Dawn, and Donna, our brothers and sisters in Christ. My brothers in office, Mike, Nicholas, and Dale. For dear friends of our congregation, Heather, Joan, Dave, Katie, Anita, Bert, Rowie, 
Joe, Jason, D, Marge, Jill, Dylan, Josiah, and Jeff, and indeed all who cry out to you. Heal them according to your gracious visitation, keeping them mindful at all times of your victory over death. Be with those who care for them, that they might be your instruments for their well-being, and bless their families as they remain at their side. Uphold them as they care for these, their loved ones. We ask you to be with those who mourn, to continue to pray for my brother in office and his family, uh, uh, Matt, as he mourns the death of his mother, Marie. Comfort him and all of them, indeed, with a joy, promise of a joyful reunion before your throne with all those who go before us in the faith. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, soul, all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, I'm turning to hymn 601, and it is a hymn by Thomas, I said Thomas Akempis uh, as I was speaking, it's Thomas Kingo, died in 1703, all who believed and are baptized. All who believed and are baptized shall see the Lord's salvation. Baptized into the death of Christ, they are a new creation. Through Christ's redemption they shall stand among the glorious heavenly band of every tribe and nation. With one accord, O oh God, we pray, grant us your Holy Spirit. Help us in our infirmity, through Jesus' blood and merit. Grant us to grow in grace each day, that by this sacrament we may eternal life inherit. And that's the hymn by Thomas Kingo, All Who Believe and Are Baptized, Hymn 601. With that, my brothers and sisters, I bid you a blessed evening, blessed rests, and by God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.